Well, this is a fun Sunday for us together as a family. As a body of believers, we get to enjoy hearing of God's grace in a life in the waters of baptism, and we get to rejoice with those who are formally committing to membership at Grace Bible Church. I want to turn your attention this morning to Matthew 28. This is, of course, the Great Commission, Jesus' final instructions before ascending to the Father, to his disciples. In Matthew 28, 18, Jesus came and spoke to the disciples. This is after the resurrection. And he says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore... And make disciples of all the nations. And then he gives some descriptors of what making disciples looks like. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all that he commands. And Jesus promises, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And the directions that Jesus gave the apostles then are directions for us today. The promise of his presence And the continuing nature of this commission extends even to this body of believers, uh, even to us who are gathered here this morning. A disciple of Jesus is a follower, a learner of Jesus Christ, one who has submitted him or herself underneath the lordship and the teaching of Christ, one who has set his life on following Christ, and a disciple or a learner is to be made of all the nations, That is, Jesus has purchased for himself people from every tongue and tribe and nation and people, and he uses means to bring those people to himself through the proclamation of the gospel. That is, when you and I proclaim Christ to a lost and dying world, God brings people to himself in faith. They believe in Christ, they turn from their sins, they turn to him, and they become disciples themselves. And the disciples is publicly proclaiming, I belong to Christ. I no longer live. Christ lives in me. I died with him, and now I live in newness of Christ's resurrection life and power. I'm no longer a slave of sin. I'm a slave of Jesus Christ. And friends, this is good news. You see, what we will hear from Joshua in a few moments is not how great Joshua is, not about the great things that he has done, He could not merit God's love. None of us can. We are sinful from birth. We act out of our sin natures and we displease God with every breath until he makes us alive. What Joshua will boast in is not how he has cleaned up his life to make himself right before God, but how God has transferred him from slavery to sin unto newness of life in Christ And only because Jesus Christ has gone to the cross and paid for every sin on Joshua's behalf, past, present, and future. And friends, you need to know that the life transformation on display this morning is available to anyone who would believe, anyone who would surrender to Jesus Christ. You can find life and light and transformation and freedom even here this day. So Joshua Abreu Rosa, did I get all the R's in there? Would you come and tell us about God's grace in your life? My life before Christ was very different than it is now. I had thought processes that were very manipulative and malicious. Outwardly, I may sometimes look fine, but inwardly I was full of anger, impatient and selfishness. Sometimes it seemed to explode out of me in bursts of anger. Few would know that. I lacked self-control, peace, and tolerance towards others at the heart level. In summary, I lived for myself, and I was okay with it. There was, not a lot, there was a lot of sin in my life, 
but I didn't feel the weight of my sin. I was obvious to the fact that that I needed God. I felt like I was good and I knew I wasn't perfect, but I didn't feel like I needed to ask God for forgiveness for anything. God saw my sin as offensive, but I didn't. I needed him to reveal it. Then I crossed the line that I never thought I would cross. I turned to be someone that I knew for a great time of my life, and it made me feel like I was at rock bottom. I was lost. I had to look for answers. I can't explain it, but I think Ephesians does a really good job of it. Praise but to God and our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in heaven, heavenly realm with spiritual blessing in Christ. He chose us in him before creation of the world to be holiness in his sight. He predestined us for adoption uh, to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. I owned a Bible my whole life, and I hadn't been exposed to stories in it. Um, and I never really read it myself. And I never been drawn to the Bible or felt like I needed to go to the Bible for answers. This time, I opened my Bible, and I went to John, and I heard the gospel. And I've heard it before, but not like this, not like how it felt this day and for the first time. In John, the good news of Jesus dying for my sin was good news for me. God used my sin, and God used a miserable situation that I had caused to bring me to the end of myself and draw me to him. I read in John 17 as Jesus prayed for his own, and I saw Jesus there for me in his love. How could I not love and trust Jesus? People might die for a good person, but... Jesus loved and died for me, a sinner who ignored him my whole life. I've been drawn to worldly desires and ignored Jesus, and Jesus drew me away from the world and to him. God used all these different circumstances in my life to bring about change and, and how he perceived in my life. Reading the Bible was so out of character for me, and I knew it had to be God. Before, I would use my time mindlessly to watch YouTube videos, and now for reasons I could only say were God. I wanted to use my free time to read the Bible, listen to sermons, watch videos that would teach me about who God was. I wasn't aware of my sin before, and I didn't feel like I was doing what was wrong, and now it felt wrong. I wanted to know why, and the Bible showed me the answer. Romans 3, 23, 26. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. I was a sinner. I was dead in my trespasses and sins, and God's great love and mercy shined in and saved me. God died for my sins, forgiving them and freeing me from their power. The price is that God sent his only son to die for my sins. I have earned the sentence of death because of my sin. Jesus, who had lived a sinless life, died instead of on my behalf. By all accounts, whether I knew him or not, I deserved death. But by his grace alone, Christ died for my sins and was raised to life. God saves through faith, not by trying harder. Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself. It is a gift, not by works, so that no one can boast. It's really hard to let go of our own efforts and trust completely in God, but that's the only way God saves through faith. And there's nothing... I could do or you can do. I mean, I let go of my own efforts and faith in myself and put faith in God. It was only then that God freed me from my sin and made me new. I have faith. I'm promised a new life and an eternal life. 
God is such a beautiful mentor, and he's patient and kind and gentle to reveal sin slowly and continue change my heart to run after him more each day. I used to be a slave to sin. I've come to obey from the heart the patterns of the teaching that has claimed my allegiance. I've been set free, and this is by God's righteousness. The things that are different in my life is my thinking, my anger, my new desires. I still sin, but I see my sin differently than I did before. Now I see sin for what it is, and I'm aware of it, and where I wasn't, I didn't know it before. God's grace for the first time has given me the power and desire to fight sin. I realize now that I was bought with a price, Jesus' blood, and now I want to glorify God with my body. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20 speaks to my life more than any verse I've read. Do you not know your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who's in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. The Spirit is actively pursuing God, and he produces the fruits that shows the physical works here. I love God, and I have joy in my heart. My debt's been paid, and I'm free to be better. Sin has lost its power. This is truly death and life. And so I desire to be baptized today to show everybody what God has done in my life. Jesus commands us to be baptized. I died to my old self, and I'm alive in Christ. Baptism shows this. But when you see me go under the water, it shows that I died to my old master of sin. When I come up, it shows what God did, represents my surrender and faith, and the resulting new life in my new master. So I follow. And that's my testimony. Josh, because of your testimony of God's miraculous work in your life, it is my joy to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. pray with me. God, we give you praise. Only you can do supernatural work in the heart of man to bring us to repentance and faith, to grant life, to raise the spiritually dead to spiritual life. And we praise you for your work in Joshua's life, the heart level. We thank you for his boldness and his boast in Christ. God, we pray that you would cause all of us to feel again the freshness of salvation, to remember what it was like to be your enemy and to remember again the newness of being your friends, your sons, your daughters, your own people. God, we pray that you would reignite in our own hearts a desire to make the gospel known to those around us who need to hear. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we also this morning have the opportunity to welcome those into membership at Grace Bible Church who are pledging a formal commitment to this church. And I want you to turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. This is a text that we've been in the last few weeks. And Romans chapter 12 begins the outworking of the Christian life in this letter of Paul to the churches at Rome. And it begins, of course, as we've looked with the believer 
presenting himself as a living sacrifice before God, resisting the impulse of the world to squeeze us into its mold and to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. That works itself out in us thinking humbly about ourselves and us thinking rightly about those around us, that we are, in fact, members of one another. And I want to pick up in verse 3 and read through, read through verse 13. We'll look at these in detail in the coming weeks, but just to get a survey of what it is like as a Christian to be in the body of Christ, this is as good a place as any to see the flavor of what God has designed. Paul writes, Romans 12, beginning in verse 3, For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. If prophecy according to the proportion of his faith, if service in his serving, if he who teaches in his teaching, or he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor, not lagging behind in diligence. Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation. Devoted to prayer. Contributing to the needs of the saints. Practicing hospitality. This is the reign of grace in flesh and blood. This is what grace that saves a believer does in the life of a believer. That is, grace not only unites us with Christ, but unites us with each other. We are united to each other even as the various parts of a physical body are connected to one another. That is, intimately connected in interdependent relationships. No part of your body would do well without the other parts of the body. And so we are members of one another, even as a physical body, dependent on one another, giving life to one another. And we see these commands here, love without hypocrisy, abhorring what is evil, clinging to what is good, being devoted to one another in brotherly love, preferring one another in honor, not lagging in diligence, but fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. These real life flesh and blood commands paint a picture of what body life is to be like. And it demands that we are not sort of casually connected by similar ideas, but that we are actually relationally connected like a family or like a physical body. The church was designed by God to be, to be the community where individual believers exercise the gifts that God has given them for the benefit of the others. It is the organism that God has designed where individual believers live out the love of Christ where individual believers learn to prefer others instead of themselves, where individual believers learn to not think more highly of themselves than they ought. These are very real, tangible, concrete expressions of the power of God in the gospel and the grace of God in Christ lived out in a life. And it is a life lived together. The New Testament has not a category for a lone ranger Christian for a Christian living the Christian life sort of out on his own. It's me and Jesus. That is not the New Testament ideal. That is not the New Testament picture. In fact, the pictures the Bible gives of the Christian life carry the metaphors of a physical body, we are members of one another, or a building, we are our all individual bricks that don't do well as a brick on the sidewalk all by itself, not living up to its purpose but built together into one structure serving a purpose for the glory of God. 
we are also considered sheep in a flock. Individual sheep wandering about on the hills are called breakfast. (laughs) But a flock of sheep together, cared for by the chief shepherd, they are a community for God's purposes. These metaphors in scripture are designed to remind us that we do not thrive singly, alone, out there, floating about, me and my testimony in Jesus. But we are designed with gifts to thrive and to help others to grow and thrive in the body of Christ. Some have said, well, I don't see membership in the New Testament. I would encourage you, if you've thought along those lines, to sign up for the next membership class because I think a case can be made from the New Testament for a formal membership process. I want to highlight just a a few things that give evidence to the fact that in the first generation of the church, individual Christians were gathered together formally because they were known. They were known by the leadership of the local church. They were cared for by each other and by the leadership of the local church, and they were even numbered. I want to give you just a few evidences of this on the pages of the New Testament. First of all, believers were numbered, and the church knew who they were. As you trace through the book of Acts, specific numbers are given. How many joined the fellowship of believers in Jerusalem on a given day? No less than four times in the book of Acts, you have a specific number given for believers. That is, a number of people was known, and they were accounted for. Secondly, converts to Christ were cared for. That means their needs were known, discrepancies in the meeting of those needs were addressed, and people's physical and real tangible needs were met in the context of the local church. Thirdly, believers deliberately and visibly associated with the church. We see that most prominently in Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5 might be considered the first instance of church discipline, where God himself took Ananias and Sapphira killed them because they were lying to the Holy Spirit and God wanted a pure church. And the interesting thing about Acts chapter 5 is that believers all the more joined visibly with the local assembly of believers. (laughs) Far from being a, a thing that moved people away from the church who loved Christ, it brought people close. And the interesting feature in Acts chapter 5 is the world that watched respected the church and said, I don't want to go be a part of that group. And people came as they were converted. In other words, the gospel transforms a life and then joined people to this unique body of believers with a combined loyalty and fidelity visibly to Christ. Nowhere in the New Testament is there evidence that the church was designed by God to be a loose affiliation of people who more or less had the same beliefs. In fact, the very word church becomes a technical word in the New Testament. 120 times in the New Testament, this word ecclesia or church is used as a technical term. And 105 of those refer to specific local assemblies of believers. I know it's popular today to say, well, I'm just part of the church generally, invisibly. Whoever belongs to Christ, just out there is the church. But that's not the way the New Testament views the church. It is true that everyone who belongs to Christ by forgiveness of sins in the gospel is the church universal and belongs to Jesus. But on the pages of the New Testament, that church universal finds itself physically located together in community. The instructions to leaders of the church expect intentional commitment of association in local assemblies. Instructions to those under leadership require intentional, not a casual commitment to the local church. And all of those beautiful one another commands of the New Testament, love one another, serve one another, pray for one another, bear one another's burdens. Nearly two dozen of those commands indicate that we are to be intentionally connected to each other. Is it possible that if you're too close to people in the church, you might get offended. Of course it is. The only people that populate the church are people who still sin. 
And the closer we are to each other, the more likely it is that we will sin against each other. In fact, if you haven't been sinned against lately, you're probably not close enough to other members of the body of Christ. I'll make another plug for small groups. You should be in a small group fellowship. You should be intimately connected to others in the body of Christ so that we rub against one another, so that we benefit from one another, so that the gifts that God has given each of us as a stewardship actually serve the purposes for which he gave, the benefit and growth of the whole body. All of these things indicate to us that participation in the local church is not a consumeristic enterprise, right? The ministry of the local church is not an hour and a half performance up on the stage that you consumers all come and uh, just enjoy or don't enjoy and move on to something else that you might like better. No, the ministry of the local church is everyone in this room who knows and loves Jesus Christ living out selfless, sacrificial love for the benefit of one another as a community testimony of the kinds of things Joshua just described in his own individual life. All of these realities we see in Romans chapter 12 are to be true of individual Christians, and they are to be true of the collection of believers together in the local assembly called the church. We as a body of believers are to be those who let love be without hypocrisy. We as a body of believers together bear the testimony of the reign of grace in the life of this church to abhor what is evil and to cling to what is good, to be devoted to one another in brotherly love, to outdo one another in preferring each other in honor, to not lag behind in diligence, but to be fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation. By the way, we, we do these things together. One member of the body suffers and we are all to suffer alongside. To be collectively together devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. All of this together is what it means for us as a body of believers to be living sacrifices, not squeezed into the mold of this world, but being transformed by the renewing of our minds, thinking rightly about ourselves humbly and using our gifts. A number of believers here this morning have committed to a formal commitment to Grace Bible Church in membership. They're considering Grace Bible Church to be their home, uh, the local assembly of believers that they have decided to join together with to use their gifts and to benefit from your use of your gifts in their lives. They have decided on an affinity with the doctrine of Grace Bible Church, the philosophy of ministry of Grace Bible Church, the leadership of Grace Bible Church. Each of the candidates for membership here this morning have had an interview with one of the pastors here and they have shared their testimony. They have told us how they have been transformed by the grace of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. The elders of Grace Bible Church are eager to put them forward to you as members of this church. Having shared their testimonies, having been baptized through water baptism as believers, having affirmed the doctrine of Grace Bible Church and eager to serve uh, most of these are already serving in visible ways. Uh, most of those who are becoming members today are not strangers to the rest of us. <laughs> they have already jumped into the body life of this church. You have already been benefiting from God's grace in their lives. And they are committing this day to read our church covenant together and to formalize their commitment to this body of believers by the way, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you have not yet committed formally to a local church, or, or if you've made this church your home and have not yet committed formally, I want to invite you to sign up for the membership class. Find out more about what it means to be committed formally to Grace Bible Church and the benefits of doing such. So at this time, I would like to invite these up. I'll call out your names, and then when they're assembled up here, we'll have the uh, church covenant up on the screen. And all of us who are members of Grace Bible Church will stand together and we'll read the church covenant with these new candidates. So I'd like to invite Josh Abreu Rosa 
and Stephanie. I just wanted to, I didn't want to say Josh and Stephanie because I wanted to say the last name twice. <laughs> and Stephanie, Abreu Rosa, <laughs> Sandy Brandt, Acadia Cow. Greg and Elisa Gonzalez couldn't be here this morning. Um, they are committing to membership, uh, but their kitchen exploded overnight and flooded, and so they're dealing with that this morning. We might have them just stand up and memorize the covenant next week and read it to you. <laughs> Jason and Holly Beakley, John Kingsley, Brian Moon, Stephen and Celeste Olmstead, and Henry Yao. Please come forward. We are so thrilled that you have committed to being a part of this body. We're going to put the church covenant up on the screen. And I'd like for all of you who are members at Grace Bible Church to go ahead and stand up. And uh, we're going to read this together out loud. And uh, you, if you can see the back screen and read that, if not, candidates, you're welcome to turn around and see the closer version, whatever you'd like to do. And let's read this together. Humbly trusting that God has graciously brought us to repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and having been baptized upon our profession of faith in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, we do now in dependence upon God's gracious help, solemnly enter into covenant with one another. We will pray for and be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the church, being a peacemaker with all in the church. We will walk together in brotherly love, exercising an affectionate care and watchfulness over each other, faithfully encouraging, admonishing, and in treating one another as occasion may require, seeking with tenderness and sympathy to bear each other's burdens and sorrows, being slow to take offense and quick to forgive and reconcile with one another. We will strive for the advancement of this church for Christ's sake by not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together by remaining faithful to God's word concerning our biblical doctrines, church discipline, the Lord's table, and believer's baptism, by exercising the spiritual gifts given to us as members of the body of Christ, by giving cheerfully and sacrificially to support the gospel ministry of the church as it extends both into this community and the nations. We will seek to live boldly as witnesses for Jesus Christ where God has placed us, living a transformed life and proclaiming the gospel that the mission of Jesus Christ might advance in this world. We will persevere in raising our children under God's watchful care that they might, by his grace, repent and believe in the gospel of his son, Jesus Christ. We will if we move from this church as soon as possible, unite with another local church where we can obediently live under God's word in fellowship and where we can carry out the spirit of this covenant in the body of Christ. At this time, I'd like to invite the elders forward and we're going to give them the right hand of fellowship, a handshake. Um, I think this seals the deal. I think you get to be membership, uh, members as soon as your hand is shook, shooken, shaked. <laughs> but really, the deal isn't done until you've eaten carne asada afterwards. So um, all of you can be seated, by the way. Uh, thank you. And uh, would like to remind you to, to stick around for brunch here at about uh, 1030 or so. Um, I'm going to close us in prayer after all these are welcomed in, and then uh, we'll sing again and uh, go eat together. Let me pray. Lord, we thank you for these dear friends, really miracles of your work, trophies of your grace, lives transformed by the gospel and placed into the body of Christ. What a gift from you, that you have brought these here with all of the ways that you have invested your gifts in them. We pray that we might benefit 
and we pray that we might be of benefit to them, that we would live out the one another's and the body life as members of each other, that we would truly lo love sacrificially and live humbly with one another as a testimony to the world of your transforming power. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.